Welcome to Keeping You in the Family with Dr. Margaret Aranda on the Claw 360 Network. Dr. Margaret Aranda. I'm so happy to be with you this evening and thank you for joining us. Uh, this show is called Keeping You in the Family. We're with Call 360 Network for your daily dose of truth. Uh, there are two ways to listen to tonight's program. One is through the website at www.connation.com or the YouTube channel, which is Keeping You in the Family. You can chat live with the audience during this show, and you can also be sure, if you don't mind, to also sub subscribe to all of the Call 360 networks on YouTube channels as well. And if you'd like to be a part of this show or a volunteer for any of the shows that Jonelle and Con Nation do, uh, or if you have a future uh, mailbag question that you would like for me to answer, Go ahead and email us at Jonelle, J-O-N-E-L-L-E -L -L -E dot Elgaway, E-L-G-A-W-A-Y at C-A-W 360 dot com. And I'm so pleased to bring to you what I think is a really important topic for patients uh, with chronic pain uh, in the United States. Uh, the topic is topical and regional anesthesia. Uh, if you'd like to share how you've been treated, I'm sure we'll probably get a lot of comments in particular regarding epidural steroid injections. If you'd like to share how you've been treated or have any questions, go ahead and call us at area code 415-403-2715. And just uh, stay on topic if, when you call in and uh, help us to make this show fit you really well. Uh, we've already done a series on diet, sleep, sex hormones, as well as bone, joint, and nerve stability. Last week was anti-inflammatories, steroids, and regenerative medicine. Today is topical and regional anesthesia, and you'll also want to not miss next week's on microglial cell inhibitors, and the following week is on pain medication, which is probably what everybody really wants to hear about. Um, so on the next note... Uh, you'll see that when we talk about um, epidural steroid injections in particular, there are a lot of things that can happen. There, you can get an accidental spinal tap. Uh, the epidural could also go very well. Uh, you see a lot of words there, anesthesia, hospital, surgical, obstetric, because they do epidurals for C-sections and for labor pain as well. You'll see paraplegia, brain. Uh, strokes are possible, paralysis is possible, and we'll get to all of this. It, it can be confusing, but if we're going to give you the straight science first, like we always do, and then hope that once you understand how things work, you'll understand what the purpose of the procedure is, as well as the complications. So just to recap what we've been through so far, when we spoke about diet, we talked about the anti-inflammatory sub-diet of the Whole30, as well as the antihistamine diet and the low glycemic diet, which is something that you'll want to be on for life if you have pain. Uh, when we did the talk on sleep and insomnia, we uh, really, I talked to two other patients today, one who's now sleeping for eight hours a night, the other who's now sleeping 11 hours a night. Uh, for the first time in like 10 years. I like a mixture of melatonin and magnesium, uh, but if necessary or if needed, I'll, I'll do some prescription sleepers such as Ambien or Zolpidem as well as Sonata or Zalpalon. So those are good ones that are uh, not benzos that seem to work very well. Uh, when we spoke about sex and sex hormone replacement, with the top three there that are usually discussed are estradiol, the female hormone, as well as progesterone, which can help your joints. 
uh, and testosterone, which is great for your strength, your brain health, uh, cognition, and bone density. Estradiol is also very, very wonderful for bone density. Uh, bone joint and nerve stability went into a lot of particulars with the bo bones, including uh, the DEXA scan. Uh, we talked about supplements, chondroitin glucosamine, the 3X, the triple formula is really wonderful for pe patients, especially those who complain of uh, knee pain. Uh, all my patients get vitamin B12 injections. Uh, that seems to help with energy and makes them feel better. Uh, and um, medroxyprogesterone is another progesterone uh, analog that we use also even in men for joints too. Our topics on anti-inflammatory steroids and regenerative medicine went into PRP or platelet-rich plasma injections uh, as well as stem cells. Uh, the top anti-inflammatory medication in this clinic for spinal cord injury is Ketorolac or Toradol. I prescribe that IM or sub-Q, so patients do their own self-injections. It's a really great anti-inflammatory that seems to last just about a full eight hours and allows you to treat yourself at home instead of having to go to an emergency room is what I find in our patients. All of our patients are also uh, empowered to be on uh, steroids, uh, both for flares, where they go in a tapered dose for five days of methylprednisolone, four milligrams, and uh, that seems to hold a lot of people at bay. Today, we're going to cover briefly uh, creams, gels, and patches and get right on to the epidural steroids. So uh, you can tell that there are all different kinds of topicals. I'm going to give you uh, some over-the-counter ones that I think are good to try first before even asking for anything stronger. And then regional anesthesia, we're going to focus on ESIs or epidural steroid injections. When we're talking about creams and uh, other local anesthetics, we're usually thinking about lidocaine, and most people uh, can relate to having gone to the dentist and having them do an injection of lidocaine to numb your gums for a tooth extraction or for any kind of dental rehab. Uh, it has a particular mechanism of action that causes the nerves of that area to become numb, so the nerves are not firing so much. And we can see on the next slide exactly how that works. Uh, first, we'll just talk about a few over-the-counter uh, products here. You see like a emergency survivor, survival allocane, which has a, a gel, has a cooling effect, has aloe vera in it. I know some people are allergic to aloe vera, so you wouldn't want to use that one. Uh, but you see in the middle picture, lidocaine, ointment, a 1% solution. Um, and actually, they can sell up to a 4% lidocaine solution without a prescription. Uh, and as for cream patches, there are other also lidocaine patches. There are a lot of different brands, a lot of different companies. And if one does not work for you, I recommend that you try a different one from a different company. Uh, just like our prescription patches, some Patients only seem to absorb it if it's, for example, from a particular manufacturer and none of the other ones work on them. So if you try one of these and it doesn't work on you, go ahead and try a different one from a different company, a different maker, and that one may very well work much better for you. Lidocaine uh, is, a, is an ester. Uh, the molecule is such that on the top image there, uh, you'll see the orange blob is basically a, a, a sodium channel, uh, and the sodium molecule in the round circle at the bottom of the yellow blob on the top picture transgresses uh, through that channel and goes to the other side uh, so that it can initiate uh, and stimulate another cell next to it. Uh, when we use lidocaine, it basically closes that gate so that the sodium is unable to pass through the channel and then the nerves cannot fire and carry uh, pain signals. So that's how it works. These are all different kinds of over-the-counter uh, products that you can try. There's uh, emu, blue emo lidocaine for backs and shoulders. Um, it's interesting in, in seeing what is out there even just on Amazon. Uh, that you can purchase this. Emu is actually an, uh, an 
Australian ostrich. Uh, it's a flightless bird uh, whose fat is used for oil. And some people really swear by it as an analgesic to decrease pain. And other people say it doesn't work for them at all. Uh, a lot of patients, you know, you just get the body that you were assigned to. So if blue emu doesn't work for you and or you don't like the idea of using your bird fat uh, for to put on you, then there's Aspercream. There's uh, Aspercream also makes a lidocaine patch, uh, a cream in a tube. Uh, there's a uh, biofreeze cold therapy pain relief. A lot of patients get burning pain, especially with CRPS or CRIPS or complex regional pain syndrome. It's a burning fire-like pain 24 seven. So a lot of patients like the idea of something cold going on their skin. Uh, there are, there's even a spray. Uh, there's icy hot lidocaine and there's lidocaine gel mixed with Arnica, Boswellia, MSM. Uh, and I've priced out some of these for you. There's several brands of lidocaine patches, and the one on the bottom is pretty much as strong as patch you can get without a prescription. It's four percent. And you can see a lot of these are pretty reasonably priced. Um, I think it's good to uh, go ahead and uh, pick something that works for you. Um, we have a question from Luca Decola, who asks, "I've lost so much weight. I have no butt." and I get pressure sores, what cream would be best? Well, this is a different classification of a sore. It's a bed sore or um, an ulcer actually is what it is. And in medicine, we treat that the way we treat a burn. So it needs a lot of care, a lot of wound care. It needs irrigation. It needs uh, debridement, it, so the dead skin needs to be scrubbed off of it. Uh, you need to have a special bed and a special mattress and seating cushions that don't press on it. You want to keep your weight off of that area, which is very hard to do. If your uh, buttock muscles are so small that your bone, your pelvic bone is hitting the bed, uh, but there's not enough padding there because you're low on muscle. So in some of those cases, uh, depending on what your diagnosis is, uh, in my opinion, you might be a good candidate for uh, something that will grow, help you grow tissue, like even growth hormone or uh, HCG, human chorionic gonadotropin, the stem cells. Um, there are a lot of other things, but normally you would get a visiting nurse to come and look at it at least twice a week debride it, irrigate it, redress it, and then change your dressing frequently. Uh, so I don't expect any of these things to really help you all that much. And a lot of people would say you should not put any uh, lidocaine gel on top of an open sore. It's meant for closed skin, not for open skin. So if you have a bed sore or a pressure sore, it's really an ulcer, it's another classification uh, all to its own, and it can get very bad. Um, so those things need to be seen by a professional at least twice a week with dressing changes. That was a great question, and I really appreciate your asking that too. Okay. Um, the 5% lidocaine strength is actually the maximum strength allowed by the FDA for non-prescription drugs. It's usually a starting dose for prescriptions, so there's a lot of overlap with the 5% lidocaine. Uh, it's important to understand how it is supposed to work. It only takes about three to five minutes to start working. It's only expected to last about half an hour. Uh, I'm sorry, the maximum effect uh, reaches in about 25 minutes to half an hour. So if it, half an hour goes by and you don't feel a thing, you're probably not gonna feel a thing. Um, if, however, you get some relief in, is starting in the first five minutes, it will probably help you out a lot for about an hour. And for some, um, for some patients, especially if you find yourself using all of your pills, all of your prescribed opioids or your prescribed pain medication every single 30 days, that's, you know that's not a good situation to be in for emergencies. Something like this lidocaine patch can help your pain be controlled without a tablet. 
uh, so that maybe you can save some of your tablets for emergencies. And it's important for you to think about these things. So the best use for the lidocaine cream, uh, according to some of the manufacturers, is once you put it on, you want to cover it with a plastic wrap. Uh, a lot of people, especially if it's in, say, the upper shoulders or the neck, if you can press a trigger point where you feel the muscles all balled up into spasm, you can apply pressure, heavy pressure with your thumb for a full five minutes or better yet, get somebody else to do it for you. Uh, that helps uh, that helps it to uh, get rid of the trigger point, the muscle spasm, as well as spread the medication uh, that's being absorbed under your skin so that it, it has more blood supply because of your thumb pressure. Therefore, it can carry the medication to the surrounding area a little bit better. And then you can repeat that after 15 minutes. So you can put some on for an hour. You can, you know, kind of clean it off. Some people like to put a warm pack on it as well to uh, make your skin a little bit pink. When you see your skin is a little bit pink, it's because it has increased blood supply. It's both uh, receiving medication into it from, say, a patch or the ointment, and it's also uh, carrying away toxins. So it's a good microcirculation thing to do uh, with anything that's local to increase the blood supply to that area. Uh, we have another question. Uh, can uh, HCG be bought over the counter? A uh, human chorionic gonadotropin, no, unless somebody's trying to sell it because they didn't like it or they had some left over. So no, it should be prescribed and you should get it from a clean bottle and use a, a syringe and a needle. It's usually an injectable. A pharmacy can also compound it for you if you prefer to have a little trochee that goes underneath your cheek uh, pocket inside there. You can absorb it through the mucosa if you don't like shots. Um, and then we have another question from Levitt. Hi, Levitt. You're always here. I love that. Um, is lidocaine gel better than the patch? Um, not necessarily, no. Um, and then you don't have the weight of the patch plus the weight of the gel if you're if you have allodynia or if you, I touch your skin and it hurts, uh, that's not normal, but a lot of people with pain syndromes have that. So you, you may do better with the gel by itself straight out of a tube than with a patch because a lot of people that have allodynia, that kind of touch pain, um, they can't even really have water or even air on it. So anything is bothersome. So that's really just gonna be a personal preference and again, it's going to depend on the brand of gel versus the brand of the patch. So each person is just going to be different from the rest. There's no great rule that I can give you on that one. And then the other question is, can you put too much lidocaine on? Theoretically, yes. Um, there's an overdose of lidocaine that happens. Usually that is far, far away from any of the topicals. I mean, you should not put the whole tube on your whole entire body all at once and use it all up in one sitting. Uh, so you don't want to overdose yourself on it that way. And I don't think anybody would. Uh, so yes, lidocaine can be, can be toxic. Uh, it can be dangerous if you get too much, but those uh, cases are really only seen for something like liposuction in the operating room. They uh, put the long trocar in there to suck the fat out and they're pushing in lidocaine uh, to numb it up around there too, and you get a higher dose of lidocaine, you know, into your system than you would with a gel. And the anesthesiologist calculates that out based on your weight, the number of milligrams per kilogram, and and calculates your maximum dose. And the anesthesiologist and the, and the surgeon work closely together to say, yes, he can have more. No, she can't have any more. We're already at a max. So somebody needs to be tracking that and keeping keeping tabs on that in particular. Both great questions. Okay, and then uh, what we like to do in our clinic is encourage patients to make their own topical anesthetics. And I think this is gonna be something that a lot of you can ask your doctors about. Um, the pharmacists like to be the ones who compound. Um, basically, you take a cream like Pons or any brand, plus your medications. There's a couple of 350 milligram carisoprolols right there that are scored, you put them in a pill cutter and 
and you grind them into powder and then you mix it back into the cream. When you apply a small amount of that together with an infrared light wand, you'll get the, that medication driven further into the cells, into your tissues, and it can, you'll actually be positive in a blood test for carisoprol or soma, even if you're just using it this way through your skin, because it will go into the capillaries and go into your bloodstream as well. The other caveat with this, you need to be careful not to leave that infrared light wand on for more than about five to seven minutes. You absolutely cannot fall asleep with it on. You'll probably burn yourself. Um, and, and that's not a pretty scene. Uh, so, so that would be something that you can think about doing uh, because it's, it really, uh, if you have 32 ounces of cream on a one month supply, we prescribe two tablets for every one ounce of cream. So that would be 64 tablets for a month's worth of creams, topical cream. And that's a lot less than taking it by mouth and subjecting your whole body to a soma pill when really maybe just your thigh hurts or maybe just the soles of your feet hurt. So this allows you to deliver medication where it needs to go. And I think that virtually everybody who has pain needs to pay attention to their joints, their bones, their nerves, as well as uh, topicals so that you get the medication where it's needed the most. Uh, and, and Luca also asks, she says she has tingling and numbness down both arms and hands and her skin gets very sensitive. What would be best for both forearms? Well, tingling and numbness, sometimes that does actually cause a lot of pain. Other times it's just more of a bother than anything else. Uh, if your skin is very sensitive, I like the thought of the aloe vera for sensitive skin, but I also realize some people are allergic to it. So this is another case for your forearms. You would just have to buy a few of them, buy five of them, different ones, and then just try them all. Once you find something that works for you, just stick with it. And that's going to be what your body likes. And we have a caller on the line uh, from area code 303. Hi, you're on the air. Hi, Dr. Aranda. It's Love It or Peppermint Patty. Oh, perfect. Nice to I meet you. Thank you. Oh, I love your show. Oh, thank I have you. a question about the over-the-counter, oh, you're welcome, um, anesthetics, which, uh, and I really don't understand this, so I'm hoping you can shed some light on it. It's never clear to me which one is better, a gel or a cream. And, and I don't know which one absorbs better because I do use a lot of those. So okay. if, if you could talk on that, that would be great. And I'm going to get off the line so others can call and I can. Okay, listen. sure. Thank you sure. so much. Of course. Uh, so if it's, oh, sure. Thank you so much. And it's nice to meet you in person, albeit by phone, because I see your name here on every show so far. And I really appreciate that. So between a gel and a cream, which one works better? So much of it depends on how your skin absorbs. Uh, it also depends on what you're allergic to. There are a lot of fillers in the gels and the creams. There are a lot of things that you don't know what they are. They're chemicals. So we find that the more you wear a patch, uh, especially if you have an autoimmune disease uh, like lupus or something else, the more you're going to tend to be allergic to it. The patches use gel. So when you're talking about a patch, you're also talking about gel. Um, and then the gel to most people feels cool. So they like that in the summertime. And, and other people want an ointment because their skin is dry and they want something to lubricate and moisturize the skin as well. Uh, other people don't want anything greasy, so they want a cream. So again, I think it's gonna be personal preference. Uh, the other thing is that you could do is uh, use yourself as your own uh, subject and maybe try a gel on one side and a cream on the other side and then see if maybe, you know, if the pain was about equal before you did that, see yourself if one works better than the other. Uh, I think it's pretty impossible for me to advise you on which one will end up being better, but I encourage you to try different ones, different brands. Uh, and then uh, go with what you think is, is mo most helpful. And then the caveat on that too is 
uh, that the patches are gels and they weigh more than just a gel. So it usually takes patients about two or three tries. You try one of each, try a gel, a cream, a patch, and then pretty much most people will choose one over the other, mostly because it works well and less because of the side effect. They're willing to tolerate a little greasiness with the ointment if it's going to make their, their uh, pain feel a lot better. So keep experimenting. All righty. That's great. So here are some recipes for topical creams and everything that you see here is prescription. So I can compound a cream for you. I can tell the pharmacist to make me some baclofen 2% together with a 3% diclofenac, which is an anti-inflammatory plus 5% lidocaine uh, and boom, see how that works. I can tell the uh, pharmacist to compound uh, cortisol, uh, 10 milligram per uh, 30 grams of cream and add 10 milligrams medroxyprogesterone plus uh, tetracaine 4%. I can pick and choose uh, a soma, a steroid, a local anesthetic, a ketamine, a hormone, or a steroid from this entire list and I can mix it pure as one I can mix two of them, three of them, four of them, whatever I ask the pharmacist to make, as long as they have the powders, they start from powder to make all of these, then they can make it for you. Uh, in our clinic, I feel very comfortable with patients who have been with us a long time uh, by just uh, prescribing 64 tablets of carisoprodol. We actually have a little gift pack. We have the 64 tablets plus a 32 ounce cream plus a pill crusher. So we give you a kit so you can take it home and make it yourself. And again, this is a perfect situation where baclofen, cortisol, ketamine, and methylprednisolone may be your magic recipe. There are a lot of different combinations out there that you could try or ask your doctor or pharmacist to try. Uh, sometimes your pharmacist likes to mix these up too, and they can talk to your doctor and say, hey, you know, they, the, the lidocaine uh, gel really works on this patient over the counter. But, um, you know, I was wondering if maybe we can add, uh, make our own compounded cream with uh, lidocaine 5% and tetracaine 4% and uh, ketamine 2% and baclofen 2%. I mean, I can pick four or five of these or six of these if I wanted to and have you get them all at once. So um, Luca is asking, I have a metal cage that's irritating the inside of my throat. Is there something that I can use to soothe that every day because there's lots of inflammation as well inside of my throat? So that could mean the back third of your mouth where your tonsils are and your uvula that hangs down, like where people get a sore throat when they have a tonsillitis, say. Or it could be that you have the pain more in the upper esophagus, the middle esophagus, or the lower esophagus. So I'm not sure exactly which of these four areas your throat is. Uh, certainly, there are a few things that you can do even to reach those areas. Um, you can do a, a spray. A spray can hit the back of the throat, and when you swallow it, it'll dribble down. Uh, you can do a, we have a GI cocktail, we call it, uh, that patients get in the uh, emergency room if they come in throwing up and a bad flu. Uh, there's a viscous lidocaine that you can actually swallow and it'll stick to your throat and it'll coat it and turn it numb. Now, a lot of people won't like that feeling unless they're really having a lot of pain because it, they think it feels really weird to not be able to feel yourself swallow properly or fully. So again, you know, some of these things are going to work really well for some people and not at all for others. But this is a place that you can hit. Uh, you're saying now that the bones were replaced with the metal cage, so it's around your spine. Okay, so that where the vocal cords are. So it's a, a little bit here uh, near the Adam's apple. So what can you do for that? I still think the viscous lidocaine might work. A spray still might get down there. Uh, I, the carotid arteries are right here, so I don't think I'd put heat on it for sure. Uh, 
And then I don't know if it's, some of it is posterior towards the back of the spine. Certainly a carisoprodol cream with the infrared uh, heat lamp would work in the back of your neck at the same level. That's like about C56 or C67. And uh, so I would have to experiment with you also with either a, a throat spray, a throat uh, gel, a lidocaine thickened gel, a carisoprodol to the back of the neck. You could also put carisoprodol in the front of the neck. You cannot, however, rub both sides of your neck at the same time. Doing something like this can cause your heart to stop uh, because there is a collection of vagus nerves that are around the carotid artery on each side. And uh, it's okay to do one side and rub it lightly. Um, and then you can wait a little while and, and, you know, two minutes and then do the other side very lightly also. So if it was me and I was hurting that bad, certainly I would try something in the front of my uh, neck as well to try to go to that area. Um, so thank you. And I'm sorry you had to get your uh, a cage that high up. I'm sure it does give you a lot of pain. And I'm sure that that refers more pain to your neck muscles, to your traps, your trapezius muscles here on this side. I imagine you have a lot of bunched up. Maybe you get headaches and migraines too. Um, so I would, I would be a little bit, uh, I, I take a little time trying to figure you out to see what works the best for you. So that's a little bit of a hard one, but there are still a lot of choices that you could try. So I hope, I hope that was helpful for you. Okay. Then, um, uh, we're going to have, we're going to spend the majority of our time here on epidural steroid injections. There are several things that I really want you to know about this. So I'm going to give you the science first. Uh, number one, most people are surprised when I tell them epidural steroid injections are not FDA approved. Absolutely not FDA approved. Uh, it's an off-label use for a doctor to give you an epidural steroid injection. Lots of drugs can go in there. Most in, uh, epidural injections have two drugs in them. One drug is a cane. It's a lidocaine. Uh, the second drug is a steroid. Uh, there are a bunch of, you know, there are different local anesthetics. Lidocaine is the most common. Uh, and corticosteroids, uh, like, uh, well, you'll see a list of them on the next uh, a couple slides from now. The injection size is important. Where, are you, where is the needle going to go? Is it going to go in your neck? That cervical, thoracic is your chest. Lumbar is the low back. Sacral is the lower, lower back. Uh, interlaminar and transforaminal. We'll show, I'll show you a picture. That has to do with the angle of the needle. Is the needle going straight into the middle of your spine from the back? That's the center. That's interlaminar. Or are we going to go in from the side of the spine to have the needle end up in the middle of the spine. That's transforaminal. We're gonna cross a, a foramen opening. Uh, minor complications, I mean, these are minor. An epidural headache, an accidental spinal tap, cerebral spinal fluid leak, hypertension, fainting, loss of arm strength, loss of breathing. Major complications include infection, adhesive arachnoiditis, which is 24 seven burning pain for the rest of your life. Allergy, stroke, brain edema, cauda equina syndrome is when you can't feel your bladder and you, it, it can be a surgical emergency. The, the, the nerve roots coming out of the spine at the very bottom of the spine get really irritated. Uh, it can cause seizures, can cause inflammation of vessels or vasculitis, blindness, and death. So there are a lot of really very, very serious things that can happen. Um, to make an epidural steroid injection go wrong. This has to do with uh, what a lot of people um, are used to seeing with the epidural steroid injection. You see that there's a bottle of, of steroid there, uh, you know, corticosteroid. Well, that's supposed to decrease the inflammation, but like I mentioned before, there's a local anesthetic in there too. The lidocaine, bupivacaine, and levobupivacaine are, are all local anesthetics, they work first. So that's supposed to numb and that's supposed to hit your pain. That's supposed to tell the doctor we're in the right spot at the right level delivering a drug that has cured my pain. It's gone. Later on when the lidocaine wears off, 
the steroid will kick in and it will work for a few days, a few weeks, a few months, the rest of your life. It just depends. Everybody's different. So we can see on the picture on the left how the needle is coming in from the side. It's not straight down the middle of the back. That's a translaminar approach. Uh, most of us don't hold the needle down like that. It's actually pointing upward uh, towards the middle of the spine. But you can see in the close-up picture there how the needle is delivering the medication between the bones there uh, around the, the joint spaces. And that is where a lot of the inflammation is. And that's why it's supposed to work. That's why it's supposed to be helping you, not hurting you. And many times, as, as anesthesiologists, we'll put an opioid in there for you too. Uh, fentanyl morphine are common ones used. So uh, an epidural steroid injection is an off-label use. It's not FDA required. And, and guess what? The FDA requires all of the glucocorticoid steroids have to have this statement. Uh, the safety and effectiveness of epidural administration of corticosteroids have not been established and corticosteroids are not approved for this use. Serious neurologic events, some resulting in death, have been reported with epidural injection of corticosteroids. So if you go to the FDA website and look at their uh, warning for epidural steroid injections, I think most patients would be uh, pretty, pretty uh, hesitant or at least stop and think and ponder all the things that can go wrong. And uh, I'll show you a little bit more to help you understand just how dangerous these can be. One of the things that happened is there was a batch of corticosteroid that was found to have fungus in it, and a lot of patients died because they got it injected into their epidural space. There were over 400 lawsuits against a particular company and the co-owner pled the fifth during his trial and refused to answer any questions whatsoever. 14,000 patients were exposed over an area that spanned 19 states, and it led to at least 751 infections with meningitis, which is a very painful syndrome to have, inflammation of the meninges that cover your brain and spinal cord. There were over 100 deaths. In September of 2014, one of the pharmacists, 46-year-old, uh, Glenn Adam Chin, was arrested while he was boarding a plane to Hong Kong, presumably to skip the country and all the patients. The co-founder, Barry Cadden, and him were both charged with massive racketeering conspiracy that directly led to 25 deaths. And it took a few years, uh, but in, in May of 2015, there was a settlement of $200 million for the families and victims. And uh, I want to be super clear about this. The FDA safety and warning for all the things that can go wrong with an epidural steroid injection are over and above and completely separate from this 2012 safety issue that had to do with the contaminated steroid. So. If you just take that accidental thing that happened with killing 100 patients because of fungus contamination, the FDA says, yeah, we know about that, but that has nothing to do with why we're giving you this warning. We still don't like them. They're still not approved. Uh, still a lot of badness can happen. Because when this happened in 2012 to 13, it, it, it reached uh, you know phenomenal proportions because nothing like this had ever happened before. It was a total catastrophe. It was an outbreak of fungal meningitis from contaminated steroids by a New England compounding center in Framingham, Massachusetts. They didn't even have a license to uh, dispense their drugs to all over the country. It was supposed to be just for individuals coming in with the prescription. So uh, 14 employees, I guess they were all in it together. They were prosecuted with criminal offen offenses, and they knowingly uh, were convicted of making unlabeled, unsanitary, or contaminated drugs. And that actually resulted in uh, this Drug Quality and Security Act, HR 3204, which granted the FDA authority to monitor and regulate compounded drugs. Compounded drugs are drugs that are prescribed by a doctor given who writes the recipe for somebody to hand make them for you in the pharmacy. 
So they didn't even have any protection before all this happened. And that's what that black fungus looks like. 84 cases grew out X0 hilum rostratum and aspergillus also was found in one case. Uh, usually those fungi are not a problem, but if you inject them into the epidural space, boom, it's going to surround your brain and spinal cord and cause a meningitis. Uh, and they were able to isolate it from bottles of vials of methylprednisolone that had never even been opened. So the contamination happened at the facility. So you need to report any side effects that you have to the FDA. You can go to their MedWatch program and use information in the contact FDA box at the bottom of the page. A lot of doctors probably don't even report uh, side effects or, or uh, adverse outcomes that uh, occur with these, but the serious problems, like we mentioned before, that includes loss of vision, stroke, paralysis, and death. So you're supposed to seek emergency attention if any of the following happen, including if you're in the ER or in a procedure room getting an epidural steroid injection. If you lose vision or you get blurry vision or little spots in your eyes, that's an emergency. If your arms or legs tingle, if they're suddenly weak or your face becomes numb, your arm, your leg on one side or both sides, if you get dizzy, if you get a severe headache, obviously if you have seizures, all of these are emergency situations and they can occur with or without the use of fluoroscopy. Fluoroscopy is an x-ray in the room uh, guiding the needle to where it needs to go to be properly placed, but it's not an exact science. So it doesn't matter how much care somebody is using to give you an epidural steroid injection, uh, everything from contamination of the, the product going into your body to not cleaning the skin enough before the needle goes through to it, uh, having the needle not go far enough in, have it go too deep, uh, the wrong level, up or down, a lot of different things can happen. And of the things that can happen with an epidural steroid injection, many of them are emergencies and they're very severe. There's nothing subtle about not being able to lift your arms or your legs. That's not supposed to happen. Okay. Um, on the other hand, some people get can get them in one time and then boom, they're good for two years, three years. I mean, their pain goes away. So, but the statistics show about 50% of patients feel better. Um, and then Lovett is asking, if they're not FDA approved, how does the FDA allow them to be given? Uh, because it's off-label use. They're allowing doctors to exercise the right to practice medicine and the right to uh, do a procedure on you that they feel the benefits will outweigh the risks and they've explained it all to you. So your informed consent needs to include all of the things that we just talked about. I mean, if you've, if you've had an epidural steroid injection in the past, and you're just now hearing for the first time that all these things could happen, uh, then you did not get a, a, a proper informed consent. And that's why, you know, I wrote an article on this a couple of years ago uh, with Pat Anson over at Pay News Network. I'll show you the reference to that. All of this is, not all of it, but much of this is in an article that I already wrote. And then uh, Jonelle is asking regarding epidurals in the neck, is it true that you're not supposed to get over three in the same place? And if you do, can it break down soft tissue permanently? Uh, my doctors have me get 13 of them or they would not prescribe pain medications. Well, that irritates me, number one. That's very unfortunate and uh, that's not good medicine. I'm sorry, you're a human being. You have a right to informed consent. You have a right to know it's not FDA approved. You have a right to say, I'm sorry, I do not want that in my body and I do not want to get one. I don't want one. And nobody can make you have it, including insurance companies. And your doctor's office can fight your insurance company to get you to bypass that because doctors are the only ones that are allowed to practice medicine. And okay, so in, a, in another slide, we're going to answer your question as to how many of these you can get. All right, so we'll save that for that slide. We'll, we're going to address that in just a moment. So, yeah, it can help some people. 50% can get better. So the first thing, and you're wide awake when this is happening, 
the doctor will go in, he'll uh, put a little topical maybe around the skin so that you don't feel a bigger needle going in. And he'll say, okay, I'm in the right space. Your medicine is going in. And then about 15 seconds later, they ask you, do you feel better now? Well, that's, they're asking you, is the lidocaine working? Because the lidocaine works first. It confirms that the doctor was in the right spot and that you're getting the right treatment with a local anesthetic followed by a steroid to hit that spot and make it better. If you get no pain relief, then the steroid's not gonna do anything because the lidocaine didn't do anything. And I hope that makes total sense to you. If you get partial relief, then a lot of people say, uh, it's okay to get a trial of two to three injections total in your life for the same injury. And then if none of those help, you're done. It's over for you. You never should get another one because it doesn't work in you. Some people have reported to me two or three dozen in a year. Somebody reported a hundred epidural steroid injections she had been through. The problem with repeated steroid injections, especially if they're at the same level, especially if they're using the same technique, either going straight in the spine, uh, intraluminal, or going in from the side, the transverse uh, for uh, uh, access, that makes it even a higher risk because cumulative trauma can occur by using the same spot over and over again, and that can lead to serious complications like adhesive arachnoiditis, which basically becomes lifelong disability and intractable pain. So the higher up the epidural steroid is injected, the more complications are likely. So to get an epidural, uh, to get a, a steroid injection in, in your lower back is a lot safer than getting one in your neck. It's very dangerous to get one in your neck. And, and uh, it can be fatal quicker and, and more aggressively than if you get one in the lower back. So this is another thing to understand. There are a lot of spaces there, not just the epidural space. Uh, there are very, uh, there are a lot of similarities between a, an epidural and a spinal. The spinal goes into the fluid, the CSF, the cerebral spinal fluid. You'll get a spinal tap where they're actually collecting. You see the little test tube on the right there. It's dripping cerebral spinal fluid into the test tube in the emergency room to check and see if you have a meningitis. Well, we're going to inject you in the same place to give you an epidural steroid injection. Uh, we don't want it to go into the spinal space or the intrathecal or subarachnoid space. They're all the same. The epidural is only supposed to go in the epidural space. And, and both an epidural and a spinal are given in the same positions, the same levels, the same angles, the same sterile prep. It's just a different space with different drug concentrations and a different needle. The spinal needles are smaller. The doses are smaller. The lumbar and sacral uh, epidural injections have a bigger needle and more medication in them. And this is really important on the next slide. I'll blow up the spine for you. Okay, so we get to, uh, we stripped the spinal cord on the, that image there of the bones and we have the blue part, uh, which is the pia matter surrounded by the arachnoid matter, which is a a lavender color there. And then the dura is a tough uh, sheath that covers the cerebral spinal fluid uh, and keeps it all intact. So one of the dangers that happens is that you can get a spinal tap, you can get a leak, you can go into the spinal space by accident, you'll give you an epidural headache. With those, you'll get dizzy when you stand you'll get dizzy when you lay down and sit up. So it's very positional. Um, there are two methods to treat that. So if you get a complication with a CSF leak and a spinal tap, that's a big deal. So one a conservative approach is to have you lay down flat for 24 hours. You can't bend, you can't straight uh, strain, you can't stretch or twist and consider laxative, laxatives because you're not even supposed to push a hard stool out. That's how much you can't push for six weeks. No coughing, 
no sneezing, no covering your mouth if you cough or sneeze. You don't want to have it build up pressure in your spine. No anti-inflammatory medications because whatever is going to plug up that uh, that leak has to be plugged. No caffeine, no salt, no driving, no high blood pressure, no fast heart rate. Uh, that's conservative treatment for six weeks if somebody did not offer you a blood patch. Otherwise, the definitive treatment is a blood patch. We take your own blood out of your arm, inject it back into that same space, and hope that it plugs up the leak. So you can see how one uh, complication can lead to another. And here's a close-up. So at the top, you see we just take your blood, do a sterile phlebotomy that's going to be with iodide prep, like not just alcohol, it's a surgical procedure. It's going to go around your spine. Nobody wants it contaminated. So it's got to be super, super, super clean. In fact, your arm shouldn't even look like that. It should be covered with a blue drape, like a surgical drape. It's a surgical procedure. It's going to go around your brain and spinal cord, and it doesn't need to pick up any staph infection from your skin. Uh, it's going to be injected back into that epidural space. You can see the little syringe in, in dark red with a blood patch going in to that white area, which is the epidural space. And you can see from there uh, the epidural space and the yellow is the spinal cord uh, you can see that the CSF in blue there it's like a hair's distance away from the epidural space it only takes a little teeny tiny bit so even if the bevel of that needle is just the tip of it is in the spinal space in the fluid it's you're going to shoot medication into your brain area because it's going to climb up and that's why the cervical Epidurals are much more dangerous than the ones lower down. Okay, then in the next slide. Uh, this is the article that I wrote. I summarized a lot of things for you uh, in the Pay News Network article from September 2017. I tried to whittle it down a little bit. Uh, and uh, Pat told me this, this is like one of the most uh, popular articles that he's had uh, here. And uh, Tammy is asking us, are ganglion blocks included in this? No, a ganglion block is something completely different, but it's sort of the same in that a ganglion block will use a local anesthetic and probably a steroid too, uh, depending on where that ganglion is. If you have pancreatic cancer and we want to block the celiac plexus, they could actually freeze or burn the nerve, just, just get rid of it, and that's completely different. So the, the ganglia are not around the spinal cord. They're not in the epidural or spinal space. There's a ganglion the sphenoid, and the sphenoid uh, high up in the back of your nose. If you have migraines, you can block that with a really long, uh, uh, like a Q-tip kind of thing, and uh, put medication in there to numb it up. So that's, that's definitely different. Okay, so... Uh, this is the article that you can read, and uh, it goes through a lot of what we said, just the basics, and then we can go on to the next slide. And there we are. Um, I hope you enjoyed this talk. I certainly don't mean to scare you into thinking that epidurals are completely bad because they have helped some people. However, if you've had three, and usually they're spaced out by two to three months each, uh, then, uh, and you fail them, then there's absolutely no reason to think that doing it again is going to suddenly magically work for you. And you have to think about instrumenting different areas of the spine from either the side or straight in and causing all that cumulative trauma that we spoke about. Um, so the last thing I, I want to say is that uh, if you've had a baby and you had an epidural for your baby delivery and the baby was delivered and you found your arms out, um, you know, where the anesthesiologist put them out to the side to access your IV, if your arms are so weak that you can't hold your newborn baby, it's because the injection did not go into the epidural space it went into the spinal space. And normally for labor pain, those injections are in the lower spine. So it ascended all the way up to your neck, the nerves to your arm are coming out of here, out of your neck. So that's a perfect case scenario where you should have been told, I'm sorry you can't hold your baby. 
the epidural turned into a spinal. It went too high, but don't worry. It's going to wear off. It's going to go away. And then let's see you as a follow-up. And, you know, I'd be really careful about making sure a patient understood everything and had the knowledge and the information that she can use to get over it and, and become whole again. I've had some patients that had exactly that happen to them. And the anesthesiologist, the OBGYN, the charge nurse, the recovery room nurse, the nobody told the patient she had a high spinal. She didn't even know what a high spinal was. So whenever you get an epidural, you're not supposed to have any muscle weakness. You're not supposed to be weak. You're not supposed to be so numb that you can't feel it. That's a spinal. That means it went too far into the wrong space. And uh, I really thank you for being with us today. And I'm really happy that we had our time together. I hope this is helpful to you. Um, and your doctors should be you know, pretty much fighting for you. These, these procedures are contraindicated. And people who have connective tissue injuries, bleeding tendencies, uh, Elo Stanlow syndrome is a big contraindication in my opinion because you're not going to heal well. You're going to rip. You're going to tear. You're probably going to have a CSF leak. You're probably going to get arachnoiditis. So if you have unresolved low back pain and it's not getting better, um, then you need to go ahead and, and keep uh, getting consults from doctors and anesthesia who are familiar with these procedures who can try to piece together what happened and how to best get you out of it. But in no way do I ever want you to think that you have to get one of these epidural steroid injections before you get a prescription for opioid medications. That's bad medicine, an invasive procedure that carries with it some significant risk is not uh, in most people's best interest unless there's a really extenuating circumstances. So. I want to uh, close by thanking you and just giving you uh, the rundown for the rest of the week. Uh, stay tuned on Wednesday. Uh, Dr. Thomas Klein is going to be here and he's going to have uh, John Flannery, the lawyer that knows a lot of that uh, chronic pain patients need to go through. And then Sunday at 6 p.m. we have the Don't Punish Pain Rally talk show with Claudia Miranda. And I just want to really thank you guys for your time. I know you have a busy schedule like we all do, but it's, it's worth your time to know what's going on with your body and to understand what, what the science is behind what is supposed to help you. So thank you for joining us on Keeping You in the Family. Call 360 Network. We all love you, especially when you come with, to us to get your daily dose of truth. So I'm Dr. Margaret Aranda. Signing off until next Wednesday. Have a great evening, a wonderful week, and a fantastic weekend. God bless you, and thank you all from Con Nation. Take care. Thanks for joining us for Keeping You in the Family. This program copyright 2019 by Dr. Margaret Aranda and Caw360. All rights reserved.